Today is June 8, 2009. I am Andrea Mott. It is a pleasure to conduct this interview for the Dakota Memories Oral History Project in Napoleon, North Dakota. Can you please state your full name? John Gross. John, I use an initial J because my dad's name was John. And those days when we were baptized, we only had two names. I mean, excuse me, only had that one name. There was no two names. So we used that middle initial of J because my dad's name was John. So my name is John J. Gross. When and where were you born? In Logan County, 18 miles southeast of here. <laughs> Goofed again. 18 miles southwest of here. And have you ever heard an interesting story about your birth? No. Never heard of an interesting story about my birth. Uh, well, it was November 7th, and depends how the weather was at that time. And those days, most of us were born right at home, and there were midwives to take to come there, and so I really don't know. Was there a midwife present, do you know, when, when you were born? Was there a midwife present? I, I forgot to ask that my parents Golly, I should have asked that. I don't know. Well, uh, can you please share some of your earliest memories with us? With you? Yeah, with us. What is, it, what is the earliest thing you remember? Oh, what the earliest thing? In, in, you mean in my lifetime? Mm -hmm. Well, there's just so many things I remember when I was eight years old. And, and uh, my teacher was a... This uh, German school teacher he asked, "How old are you?" And I said, eight. But it was all in German. There was a, a religion teacher. Ich bin Achter. And I remember my first day of school, of course. And uh, I remember a few things when we were little kids, and was especially the winters when it was cold. Our house was cold, and I would stand at the window and take, with the finger, scrape off the frost on the window as a little kid. And, but other than that, I don't remember really much of my, when we were little children, but I remember my first day of school. What can you tell us about your first day of school? Oh, because uh, those were the one-room schoolhouses, and probably there was a maybe... Thirty some children in the school, and there was first grade, primary, first, second, third, and that what one that way up. And uh, first day of school, I had to sit with another gal. There was double desks, and she took my. I was drawing something. She took my papers, and scrim, scrimbled it up, and I went like this. And the teacher came. What? What? What's the matter? I said, Oh. Filipina for whittle my papilla. And they all laughed. And then I asked my older brother, how come they laughed after recess, I asked him. He said, well, because you were talking German. Oh, <laughs> that's what I remember first day of school. And I never forgot that first day of school. <laughs> I don't know how old was I. Maybe seven, probably. <clears throat> What else do you remember about going to school in the one-room schoolhouse? One-room schoolhouse. Well, the one-room school, they were all in one room, of course. And then whenever your class was called, let's say, sixth grade or fifth grade, then you had to come up front, and then you had to present your lesson, and even on the, on the blackboard. And then I remember you be sitting back there. Let's say there was eight graders up front, and I was in the sixth grade. Then I would stop and look and take it all in and listen. So you, you could learn already from the upper grades as you were growing because they were all, always presenting that class up front and talking about it. That's what I remember in, in class. And some teachers probably were only out of the eighth grade because they were short of teachers. And then somebody thought if they thought somebody was capable then they would hire that teacher for the present until they would get a more qualified teacher and what do what else do i remember 
Oh, I remember playing games in the schoolyard. What kind of games would you play? Oh, we years? played the. We played pom pom pull away. And and I uh, over and yeah over. That's where you throw the ball over the schoolhouse, and then the other side would catch it. And they would come around, and if you get tagged. And uh, what other play? Oh, and then we had hopscotch. We played. I'd have to draw that on a piece of paper. How the hopscotch went? And you throw a rock, and then you ch jump with one foot, and then make it to the other end. And oh. It was, and we played ball, of course. What kind of ball? Softball, yeah. And tag, wrestling. What was your favorite? What my what's my favorite wrestling? What's my favorite? I was a pretty pretty good wrestler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but never a good ball player. I couldn't I couldn't catch the ball. And. Yeah, the school days. We'd walk to school many times, like in the winter time. Then we'd carry our dinner pails. Then we'd have to set it, set it by the stove so it wouldn't freeze by the cold stove. And what kind of what did your dinner dinner pails? What did they look like? Well, they were they were a gallon syrup pail, empty gallon syrup pails. Those were our dinner pails. That was days. Yeah, maybe we'd, if there was few, more of us kids, then you'd have two or three pails. And then you had sandwiches and whatever mother would put in there for the dinner. If, if we were lucky, we had an apple once in a while. So, what kind of food would she normally make for you and your siblings, your mother? What kind of what? What kind of food would she make for you? Oh, at home? Placenda, placenda, and bean soup, potato soup, rice soup. I liked especially potato soup when my ma made placenda. Placenda that was made out of uh, pumpkin and with and dough, and then probably probably that big. And, and we had a lot of that because there was a lot of pumpkins. And pumpkins grew rather easily, and. Uh, that was probably the main dish, and a lot of noodles, noodles because the dough, you know, the, we lived on dough, and swine and flesh. That means uh, pork, bread, cream. We ate a lot of cream. We grew up with cream, dunking the cream. That was good. I still like I still like to eat cream today. <laughs> uh, what was your favorite meal? What was my favorite meal? I would say chicken, fried chicken, and potatoes, and rice. Yeah. And what kind of desserts would your mother make? What kind of what? Desserts. Dessert. Cello. Cello. And to, to this day, I'm really grateful for cello. When my parents would, would go away for the afternoon, then my mom would make a big kettle full of cello. Then you, you had to let it set for the evening. And when the evening meal came, us boy, kids, we were just waiting for that cello to make sure that it's settled enough so we can eat cello. Jello probably was the main favorite uh, dessert, I would say. And of course, cake. My mom made a lot of cake, too. What kind of cake? Well, mostly chocolate cake. And you grew up on a farm? You grew up on a farm? I grew up on a farm, all the way. And can you, can you describe what your farm looked like? Well, those days, there wasn't that many buildings because you didn't have that many buildings. And in those days, the house didn't have to be that big because there was not all those electric, electrical appliances because there was no electricity. Anyway, the, we had a barn 
and then the chicken coop, and then the house, and down the hill where the, some kind of a granary. That was the, the basics. Oh, we had the little, ch small little chicken coops with, uh, for the little baby chicks, because those days, those days we raised all our little chicks by, uh, from the clock, from a hen, you know, they would set and they would hatch them eggs and then we'd, my mom would raise those chicks and, and we lived quite a bit on, on chicken meat. So yeah. there wasn't much buildings in those days and we didn't have no corral on the farm even, but we always had cows, bunch of cattle. And would you butcher any of these animals for the winter? I hardly, I don't think I ever remember that we butchered a beef, but always hog, hogs, or pork. That was, a, that was the main menu, and chicken. And, and of course, ducks and geese. That was the, our main menu. It seemed to me one time my dad butchered a, a beef, but really. But then we didn't have no freezers. But I remember my dad would wrap it up in a, or my mom would wrap it up and put it in, in, in some kind of a paper, and then we stuck it into the wheat, where the grain would wheat, so it, so it would stay frozen through the winter. That's, that's the beef. John, we were talking a little bit about beef. Did you have any other kind of meat source? Pork was the, our main menu as far as meat. Uh, in the fall, we'd get together with neighbors and butcher, let's say, maybe five hogs. They weigh about two to 300 pounds. And when the neighbors butchered, then we would go and help them. And uh, so it was usually done in the fall when the weather got cold. And uh, the, the fat was rendered for lard, and that was used, my mother used that for cooking, for, for grease, you know. And, uh, and then we made sausage of certain parts of the pork. And what was that process? Can you describe the, the process they used to make sausage? Of the sausage? Well, certain part of the, of the animal was used for, for was liver sausage. Liver sausage was like the liver and the, and the bottom part of the, of the hog. And when you, you, we made blood sausage, it was the same thing as the liver sausage, except we ate, oh, excuse me, we added blood. And that was taken when you, when you, when you butchered the hog and stabbed the hog, and then you catch the blood. Steered, and then it was added into it. Then was blood sausage, and the and the pork. The other parts was made for brotwurst, and that was ground up, and then in, in a big uh, container, and then you'd put in salt and pepper and garlic and seasoning. Then you'd go in with your, put your sleeve, sleeves up, and then you'd work it and mix it up and mix it up, and uh, that way. Then every once in a while, put some on the stove and fry it a little bit, and taste it. Oh, no, that should have a little more garlic. And you put more of that in, then you mix it, up, and pretty soon that was ready. I thought, well, that's ready. And the casings, we used intestines from the, from the animal. Then you'd have to scrape that and clean it and clean it, clean it and clean it. And then you'd pour water into it. And then you put the inside out, so the out is, it's outside, inside in, and then you scrape and scrape it so it's all clean. And uh, then you'd put it in with a machine, put it in there. And then we made also what you call Schwadermager. Schwadermager, that was made out of the stomach of the hog. That was also cleaned thoroughly, and then it was turned Ups, inside out, and there you would use like part of the skin and fat and the, 
uh, let's see once. Certain parts of the body of, of the hog, a little bit liver, and then you press it in there, and then you throw it in the hot water, boiling water, and then you would boil. And when it was boiling hard, then you would take it out, and then you would put it between a bench, and you put a piece of board on top, put a rock on top, and, and press it. And then let it set overnight. By that time, the grease would, would ooze out. And that was good. That was a good delicacy. And you can still buy that. They make it here in Napoleon. Some call it head cheese, but in my opinion, that's the wrong name. Head cheese, that kind of throws people off. They think, oh, cheese from a head. Uh, but that's right. We use the parts of the head to make this swadamaga and other parts of the pork. But there's just certain parts that made a good, good uh, swadamaga. Were there any other types of foods that you would make that... Um were considered delicacies? Well, what I said a while ago, La Chenda was about what's the thing that you made with pumpkin, and of course, noodles and stools. And because you know what, I just can't quickly think of it, just what all. But there was, there was a lot of dishes. With dough dishes, those mothers, those days, they could make a lot of dishes with dough. A cook and different kinds of cook and just a lot of things you could do. You could make with dough. If you had flour and meat, you could live good. Yeah. And uh, would your family often entertain guests back home? Guests? Oh, yes. Of course, there was no telephone. And uh, somebody would just come driving in. I thought, oh, well, we'll have something to eat. Will you stay for a while? And uh, let's say if there wasn't afternoon, and it wasn't the summertime, our mother would say to us kids, go out and catch the two nicest roosters that you find. But they were the young chickens, young from the spring chicks. And we'd go out and catch them and clean them, and mother would have uh, the best of chicken on the on the stove on the table for the evening. And uh, and other 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 times, my mom also had canned sausage. If there was nothing, there was always available because there was no freezer or refrigerator. Yeah, uh, that was always something. Them the mothers, they were quick to decide what they're going to fix, fix to eat. Potatoes, fix a few potatoes and whatnot that they had. What was your mother like? What was my mother like? <laughs> How can I describe that? She was a very nice lady and a good, good looking woman too. She got to be 100 years old when she died. Uh, she was a hard working woman, hard working woman. Yeah, there was no honeymoons for her. <laughs> what do you remember the most about her? I remember that she never slapped me. She never hit me. And if if she would scold me, one, once or twice she scolded me. And that really hurt me. I guess she... I could have got a licking from my dad. That wouldn't have hurt as much as when my ma just scolded me. She was a very soft, soft-spoken lady. Uh, she was, she, how should I say, she was just a nice, nice lady with hard working, had bore 16 children, you know, and 13 of us grew up, and there's still 12 of us today. Yeah, and she would get up in the morning, go out and milk, help milk the cows, stuff like that. When our when us boys would uh, harness the horses in the morning to go out to the field, she'd come out 
help us bridle the horses because the horses put their head up and us kids couldn't reach up. She would help them. She just did a lot of work all day long. Did she, did she help in the field as well? I understand she did before my time, she did, yes. Especially when it came to harvesting, when you had to head her, cut the grain. There she was helping, I heard the stories where she was helping. But that was before my time. In my time, I don't remember. No. Once in a while, my dad had a hired man to help, and but uh, no, she wasn't the field later on no more. And, and what about your father? What kind of man was he? Oh, he was kind of stern, and uh, pretty strict with us kids. And I think he had to be with all them boys. How many boys were there? About ten boys grew up. <laughs> Two died in infancy. So, oh, he, he, he could have a, a lot of fun. He liked to sing and he liked to play cards and had a lot of friends and, and tell stories. He could tell stories. Do you remember any of those stories? Well, no. I really don't remember the stories right now. But he would tell stories of the days gone by and stuff like that to, to his friends. And, and, and one time I know he could make tricks. He, he or, ordered stuff from, the, from a catalog and then he would make tricks it like a magician. He was like a magician. He could, he could do that too. He was... Or since you asked my dad, he was a church organist for... I think for about thirty some years in the in the Catholic Church, church organist, and then he would do a lot of singing at home, and that's and made us kids sing, stand beside the organ, and sing. Are you all skilled? Uh, Are you all good singers? And no, some of my brothers can't even hold a tune. <laughs> some of us are. <laughs> Yeah, some of us can't even, my brothers can't even hold a tune, but I don't know how that is. And my dad did a lot of reading. He only went to sixth grade. And those days, when my dad went to school, it was only five months. Where when I went to school, it was seven months, grade school. And when my dad went to school, it was five months. And at those days, there were no roads. And sometimes there was so much snow, cold weather, that they had a week or two, there was no school. And then you didn't have to make up those days. So then my dad was like a self-taught man. He, he had a number of newspapers, German newspapers, English, and did a lot of reading and studying. And he had like little jobs, and he was like a county commissioner and uh, a tax, tax assessor. He could do all those things with, a, with a very little education, but he, he taught himself all this. And he could read notes, he played by note too. Did he teach you that? Uh, me, me? I play, but not by notes. No, I cannot play by notes, but I do play German songs, yes. And is that, that is something that your father Yes, down. that I carried over from my dad. From all the boys, I don't want to brag, but uh, I would say I would have to be the number, number one as far as the Germans in the German songs, you know, that to, to carry this tradition on. I got a couple of brothers that like to sing too. And what, what kind of songs? What, what would he sing? What kind of songs? Well, since he played in church, so he played church songs to practice that. But he would like the folk songs, folk songs, fun songs. So, wedding songs. And then, okay, since we went that far, when we would get company, no company hardly ever was without singing. That was the tradition that you would have to be singing. 
and my dad was usually the leader of singing them German songs when the company came together. So, other than that, what else can I say about him? You know, he was handy on the round the farm too. And um, what is what is your fondest memory of him? My fondest memory. What can I say? What can I say? What can I say? On this memory. That is a hard one. Can I skip that because I can't think of it? <laughs> there are some fond memories. I'd like to talk a little bit about farm life. I know we've we've covered it a little bit as far as the animals and the the setup of of the farm. Um, can you just do you know how your family gained possession of the land? But uh, I, my youngest brother, my second youngest brother, is on the home farm, and he's all got all that information together. But I myself don't really know. Um, my dad started farming, then his dad, that had was born in Russia, his dad that came from Russia as a young man before he was married, and his dad helped him out to buy the farm. Oh, I think it belonged to my grandpa first, and then later on my dad bought it from my, my grandpa. It's as he, the way as he could pay for it with payments. And of course, and my, when my dad started farming, then the bad years came along. The depression came. Not only the drought, but there was also depression that, like we say, that dirty thirties. They were dirty thirties, but there was also depression because you couldn't hardly sell nothing or get any money for it. So that, and my dad fell right into that area, and there was a few of us that were young children, and uh, my dad would have lost the farm. Then that's what I get. But then. Then my dad helped my his dad helped him out. That was there was rented land around there, because in the dirty thirties nobody wanted to farm land no more because he did nothing grew. So, so we came through the dirty through the thirties, pretty hard. And I and of course I grew up in the thirties. I remember the thirties quite well. Am I getting off the subject? Am I doing okay? No, please. Oh. You keep telling us about the dirty thirties. Oh. What, what happened to the farm during that time? Okay. Many, many farmers lost their farms. They, <clears throat> they up and left, went out to Milwaukee, or they went to Billings, Montana, looking, working in the beet fields. Some went out to Portland or to uh, Lower Dye, California. And... Uh, but my dad survived with the help of his dad held me along. And that's probably why we were able to stay on the farm. <clears throat> there was one year my mom would say, told us later on when she was in her later years, she said, that one year <clears throat> there was no green grass for her, for her little geese. And we lived by a creek stream running through by our farm. And of course that stream was dry because there was nothing. And one year we never hitched up a grass more. Of course those days everything was done with horses so we didn't hitch up no grass more because there was nothing to cut. And then my dad he made a feed loan, feed and seed loan. And uh, he had some brought in some straw and some old hay that was brought in. But then when t time came for feeding it in the winter time, a lot of it was froze, it was poor stuff. And uh, well then your dad bought some, some molasses and poured it on the, the feed so the cows would eat it so they wouldn't starve completely to death. 
And Dad bought some cottonseed meal for nourishment. That I remember, cottonseed meal. That was some, that was that was like this one or two years. Like that was real, real bad. And uh, then, then the other th years, the th thistles started growing. We called them the Russian thistles. Thistles, and they seemed to grow real good at the when it was dry. And then pigeon grass came, and that made made some hay. The thistles made good hay. We had to be careful to get that thistles up when it was pretty green. Otherwise, it would get too sticky, too too hard for the cattle to eat and to haul home. So we fed a lot of thistles, and we, we think we got the cattle through that way. And, um, and we lived far from town, of course, and there was no cars. We lived 20, oh, let's say 18, about 80 miles to Napoleon, about almost the same distance to Wishick, almost the same distance to Linton. We lived right in that center. And it was hard to get, get to it to the city or to town. And I remember one time you couldn't hardly sell no grain, what little grain there was. I know we had some uh, rye, old rye. Then my dad said, we're going to try and see if that burns, because you couldn't get nothing for it. So my dad brought in a pail and threw it in the stove. Sure as heck, that stuff burned. So we burned some rye for heating, you know. And uh, well, for the cook stove, we uh, usually had to go and gather uh, cow pies, dried cow pies and, and manure, you know, dried manure that was cured. And that kind of kept us go going there. Then also in the fall, Dad would go with by team to town and get a load of coal with a wagon, with a trailer or with a wagon with two horses. And he would leave early in the morning, so he would get back by late at night. That's that's how it was. And <clears throat> yeah, and us, because us, us the young kids never knew knew the hardships of our parents. What what they went what they went through. And how did your mother feed you all during this time? It was it was hard. It must have been difficult, because you didn't go to the store and buy this and buy this and buy that. There was well, there was always enough pork around pork meat, and there's always some cows that gave a little milk. We got a little milk out of it and a little cream. And flour was hauled in in the fall, maybe let's say, if we bought it by the 100 pounds, maybe 10 bags of 100 pound bags, and then it was carried up, the, up in the attic, and that lasted then for all year, the flour. So, that's, so we lived on flour and cream and milk and, and pork. That's how our mom made, got us through. And with flour, she, she could do, make a lot of things, you know. And um, did this change huh? for you when World War II started? What, what happened to the farm oh. after the Dirty Thirties? Well, I guess that could be, you know, a lot of it could be added by the Dirty Thirties there. Because sugar was rationed, some other f food was rationed, you couldn't get it. And, uh, and the farm equipment was rationed, you couldn't get it. How did that affect the farm? Well, very little, because we didn't have no elect electric light bill. We didn't have no gas bill, because there was, we didn't have no car. And we didn't have no, my dad didn't have no, no uh, hospital insurance or, or medical insurance. You were just hoping you don't get sick. And when, when one got sick, you didn't just get, get to the doctor right away either. I had two of my siblings that died. Well, one, one was maybe two weeks old or a month old. Maybe one was like two months old. And of course, you know, you you treated them the way, the way maybe from a neighbor there came in to help tell you what to do, what kind of this do this or do that, and so you just didn't run to the doctor, you know. So there wasn't that much expensive expenses as uh, as there would be now. So that's probably how we got through 
although like I say, there was many farmers, they, they up and left them to say that enough is enough. Okay, and then your question, you came along, well, we had Herbert Hoover during the Depression. Herbert Hoover was the president, of course. And what I hear, the farmers didn't think that he was a good president. And then came Franklin D. Roosevelt coming, coming, he says, coming with a new deal. He's got a new deal for the people to get the people out of this rut. I understand even in the big, bigger cities, the people were standing in the soup lines. It was very, very bad. And I think it was also bad in other country, countries too, like in Germany and all this. That's how Hitler got into power. He came on, he's got something for the people because things were going bad. Usually when something like this happens, it's worldwide. And uh, anyway, Franklin Roosevelt came on along with a new deal. And he promised this and this and that, and he got voted in. I'm afraid to say the date, May, am I wrong? Was it maybe, I'm not, I'm afraid to say the date just when he was elected. I should know, because it, that got into my era. And then of course, World War II came along. And, uh, but bef okay, when Roosevelt came, was president, then he created jobs. Then there was CCCs, Civil Service Conservation. So the, a lot of young boys went, they got jobs working for the C CCCs in, in different parts of the state, even some out of the state. Was and, anyone in your family there? No, uh-uh, but we were too young yet. And then there was, in the around the home, there was a, Workmen, there was a works project going on to build roads and dams. That's where my dad got involved in that. And my dad was like a road overseer. And then my older brother, I'm the second oldest. So we got to work on the road too. My dad was like road boss there for this certain area. And so my, my brother, older brother and me, we worked as one man. We got paid same as one man. But I always say, I think we did, each one of us did as much as one man did. But we got paid as one man because there was a lot of rocks to pick along the roads when we was building the roads, and we didn't have to bend down so far to pick up them rocks. So we hauled a lot of rocks. And then at the same time, we also had to run the team with the scraper. Uh, there was like four horses was on the scraper. And it took a strong man to run the scraper. There was a long handle. And the team had four lines, four horses. So one of us boys would run the, would run the team to fix the roads and to fix dams. And that was, then you got paid. That was a government project. So those days you had to work if you wanted to get for anything there was. There was no food stamps or there was no... Uh, Social Security, there was n no anything like that. There was just, you just had to struggle how to make that live, how to, how to survive. And uh, so, is that, you answer your question, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, what, did, what did your father think of the New Deal? Of what? Of the New Deal. Oh, he, as, much, as much as I know, he, he that was the thing that, that came along. Then there was Bill Langer. He was a governor and he was in legislature. He helped the farmers. But I'm not that much in the politics so I can't really talk too much about it. But I know that uh, Roosevelt did, did a lot. I did a lot for the, for, the, for the people. But he was a Democrat and of course there are still some people that didn't like him because he was a Democrat. But he did a lot for the, for the common people. He brought us out of the rut. And then the, then the 40s came along, then it started raining. I remember the, when the 40s came along, 40, 41, my, or even the later 30s, my dad would, when a, a storm would come up in the west, and then it was all blue. My dad would look out of the window. Are we going to get rain? Are we going to get rain? 
and then pretty soon the, the wind would shift, come from the west, and it would blow over, and nothing. Few drops would fall. And, and so we had a lot of them kind of storms, but nothing, nothing would come, nothing, not no rain. And uh, anyway, uh, and of course, there was a lot of gophers those days. How did you deal with the gophers? Oh, my older brother and me, we caught gophers and caught gophers and caught gophers. And there was an incentive. The, the county paid like a cent for a tail and then one time two cents for a tail. And how would you catch them? We ca we'd catch them with little traps. Dad would buy us some little traps. There was some, we had a neighbor boy, he'd, he would catch them with a snare. With, with a string and then he, with a loop and then he would go for comes out and he would jerk and then he would catch him that way. And of course that neighbor boy, he also would cut the tails off and let the gopher run so they would make more gophers because the tails brought us money. Anyway, I recall, you know, then we would string the, tail, the tails up into a thread with a needle and then we had probably, it looked like a fox tail, maybe because all tails, 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 tails. And then parents would take it to town and sell it, then we come home and they got a little change. We'd make our, our, our spending money that way. Well, we were little at that time. And then, what, then one time, my parents went to town and they came home. And then I said to, None of us would want to ask, Mom, what did them gopher tails bring? And then, <laughs> then I waited a while for this one. I said to my mom, did you get rid of them gopher tails? Yeah. Well, what, what did they bring? Oh, I got $4 for them. But then she showed some groceries that was said there. That's, that's what she used to buy the groceries. And that was the last I ever said. And that's my brother didn't say nothing, because we we could see the the feelings or the hardships of uh, of the parents, because there was there was no extra money, you know, something something like that. So uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, that's we got some little spending money, and then as we got a little bit bigger, and then we would start trapping. We caught on to trapping. And then we would catch skunks. You know, skunks brought them quite a bit of money. How much? Well, uh, if it was a big skunk, it brought four dollars, two dollars, three dollars, and that was money those days. That's like you had to get into the early forties at that time, the early forties maybe, the late thirties, forties, and uh, then we'd skin them. And how would you catch the skunks? Did, were you ever afraid of getting um, sprayed? Yes. <laughs> I did get sprayed. And, and I'm sure our clothing didn't smell so good either when we got into the house. But our mom overlooked that because she could see the importance of that, that earning a little money. Uh, pretty soon we got wise. Then we started catching the, them skunks already in, uh, see there's a skunk season, or a, a fur bearing season, that the, where the fur has to be good in order to bring the top money. And there was a time where the season would open for skunks, whistle, mink, raccoon, or what you have, badger, muskrat, whatever. And uh, then we would get smart. Then we'd catch some skunks early and bring them home alive and, hot, and put them in the chicken coop and feed them till the, till the weather got cold. And then we would catch, kill them skunks. And then, of course, they would spray. And then we would bury, dig a hole, oh, about four feet deep in the, in the, in the dirt. And then you cover it up, and then we leave it covered up, or oh, maybe two days at the most. That would draw out the smell, and then we take it out, and then we skin it, and then we stretch the skin, see. 
And then when it was cold, then the four buyers would come around. And, oh yeah, oh yeah, it got scum. Well, it was cold weather. They didn't spend any time looking how good that four was. And there was some good four in there. There was some that's not so good. And so we got pretty good, pretty good money. Sometimes we would send someone that four away. I'm moving around too much. Sometimes we'd spend some, send some of that four away to a, to a four company. And then at, during, the, during the 30s, the land blew so much. That's one thing I didn't touch yet. The land blew the topsoil off. It blew and blew and blew. It made sand dunes. And the hills were bare, topsoil off. And then pretty soon we got smart, we start finding Indian arrowheads. So we'd walk around all them hills looking for Indian arrowheads and we found a good good uh, collection of Indian arrowheads. What did you do with those? Okay, we'd sell them. Pretty soon somebody would come out from the city and they'd drive around and say, hey, have you got any Indian arrowheads? Oh, yeah, let me see them. Oh, yeah, this is worth a nickel. This one is worth a dime. Maybe this one is a better one that would bring 15 cents. That's how we, that we earned some more money that way, Indian arrowheads. I still have a couple of them, I guess, that I've saved. But, but like a fool, we sold all those, those Indian arrowheads for practically nothing. Well, for us, it was money at those days. And we already know where there was a hill that was blown off. It sure as hell, you walk long enough, pretty soon you find a nice Indian arrowhead. Some were small. They were, seemed like they were made out of flint out of a, some kind of a shiny rock, some kind of a flint. And uh, that was another way of earning a little money. So, and of course we, we grew up very uh, conservative, or should I say frugal. And when we went to town and my dad would give us a quarter, right, as we got older and we came back home, we still had a dime left because you always make sure you had some money left over yet. You didn't spend it all because you could buy a Kuna ice cream for a nickel or whatever it was. And, uh, uh, what else did you do in town? What, oh, what, did, what else did we do in town? Well, there was, whenever there was a dance, we would go to a dance and there was, you'd have to pay a quarter to get in to the dance, and that, that took up almost our money. And uh, then we watched roller skating. Of course, I never could roller skate. And uh, well, we didn't get to town much, to tell you, to tell you that's how it was. We didn't get to town much, because we lived in a neighborhood. We would go to the neighbors, visit the neighbors, by horseback riding and, and by team. Uh, we're going back to Roosevelt. And then, of course, the war started. We got attacked by the Jap by the those days we called the Japs in uh, December 7, 1941. We got, and uh, 41, well, I was born in 24, so I would have been like 17 years old. Then I didn't think that I would ever be in the service. But then a lot of mail came out and there was always that sign, Uncle Sam, is Uncle Sam dressed with his big hat on, and he went like this, and I want you. And uh, by golly, pretty soon I came out to that age, I was 20, and sure as heck I got a, mess, a notice on the mail that I want you. That was in December of 44. I was got my first notice, 44. Yeah, December 44, that's when I turned 20. Well, I was still 19 when I got the message. And at 44, then I was called down to Fort Snelling. And then I, of course, then I passed by physio. And then I, I was sent home again. And then in February, I got another message. I called again down to Fort Snelling, to Minnesota. 
But then it was not quite the, the time limit where I would have to have another physical. Then I said, well, you don't need no more physical. It's only so many days. I think it had to be 80 days. So then I went right through. I went right through. Then I got my, my, well, that's March the 7th in 1945. Then I was handed the paper. You are in the United States Army. And then we stuck around Fort Snelling for a while. And then got, we got, I'm going to back up a little bit. When my dad took me to, to Napoleon to catch the train, there was so much snow. Holy smokes. There was deep cuts. We had a hard time getting to Napoleon. We had to go routing over towards Swissie, coming up by Bernstead and coming over to Napoleon that we could make it to get to the train. Anyway, going back to Fort Snelling. Then we were shipped down to uh, St. Louis, Missouri. I think it's called Jefferson Barracks in Missouri. And there we were, were outfitted with clothing, uh, <clears throat> with shoes and fancy clothing. That was really something. Now we have new clothing. Because at home, at home, we didn't have much new clothing. It was basically hand-me-downs from the older one to the, down to the other one. And then we were there for about two weeks. Then we were put on the train. And then we went to Texas, way down in, deep into Texas. And as we traveled along, choop, 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 as the, as the train went, you could see green grass, more and more green grass, more and more green grass. But as we come down to Texas, it was already getting warm and hot climate. It was quite a thing getting out of the snow, the snow banks and coming there. Well, I was interviewed to perhaps to see what branch of service I would fit in the best. And they put me in the infantry. The infantry, that's where you, you would be a walking soldier. You, know, you would not be riding the tanks or the flying the airplane. You would be in the infantry. And uh, so we had a rigorous training for till, uh, let's see, once that started out in March, February, or the last part of March, Till way about into uh, July, but that was a ri very rigorous training. They kept us going. They kept us working. The, uh, it was like this: uh, if you get on the ball, and you may just save your life that way by uh, if you are if you are physically fit and, and listen to what's going on and. Uh, yeah, that was down in Camp Hood, Texas. There was a North Camp Hood, Texas, but we were in South Camp Hood, Texas. And we were walking. Sometimes we had to have a 20-mile hike. And uh, sometimes the, the, what they called the tank battalions, they would come by, drive with a truck. And they were sending them back in the truck, and they would holler at us and make fun of us. And then we would be walking and walking and walking. And uh, they kind of load you down gradually. First, we had a back up, uh, back, pa uh, back pack, um, uh, and uh, later on, we, they, you, it was loaded down with more and more stuff. You had to carry your tent in there, and uh, clothing and stuff. And then uh, later on, well, then you got uh, a helmet that was pretty heavy steel helmet that was so heavy that I thought I couldn't, it's going to break my neck. But uh, you finally get strong and get used to that. And, uh, but I was pretty tough. I was a farm boy. My farmers, we were, we were brought up rigorously, uh, strong, uh, working hard on the farm. And even the boys from Chicago, they had to take a back seat from those that came from North Dakota, South Dakota, or Minnesota farm boys to, uh, to out 
to outwalk them or outrun them or whatnot. And uh, anyway, we had some people working for us. They had PW written on the back. And I, what the heck? Young boys like we, our age. And I started asking, what is this with this PW? How come some of them got clothing on PW? <clears throat> That's in our camp and our our orderly rooms in our kitchen. Oh, they say those are German prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. German prisoners of war. What the world. For them, the war was actually over. So I tried to talk a little bit with them, but their dialects was different, and I couldn't talk much with them, but they were prisoners of war. And, uh, and then, since we talk about it, before we went overseas, out in Oregon, our camp there again, German prisoner of war. For them, the, for them, the war had to be over. Anyway, and I was asked to be an uh, interpreter. In German, they say Dolmetscher. Interpreter. Me be interpreter. To talk from, translate from English to German. Yeah, but I thought I don't even know English good enough. The big wheel will come to me and explain something in English and I'm supposed to bring that down to the to the to them Germans and I probably wouldn't even know how to what the guy is talking in English because my English was so poor. It really was. Going back to that when I was when I was inducted in the in Fort Snelling, the clerk across me had a hard time understanding me. Then she asked the fellow next next to me what I was saying. Because my uh, my German was so broke, so broken. Because where we grew up, it was all German, German triangle. You might call it down southern North Dakota. Has, everything was German there. Well, anyway, going to the camp there, and then finally, oh, then finally, the war ended in Germany in May. Ooh, that is a blessing. That that war is over with. And that's with Germany. I hated to go to Germany and kill Germans. I felt even I'm a German, I'm considered German. That would be hard to do. And uh, even, I was even called a Nazi by one guy who called me a Nazi one time. But, uh, and of course, I'm not talking just for, for myself. There was many, many more boys. That was actually boys they could not even write a letter home. They didn't know how to write a letter. So there was, there was a lot of hardships there. Anyway, uh, and then, mm, what was it, about the 1st of August or so, 28th of July, whatever it was, I come home. My training was finished. Okay, well, the war's over in Germany. Good. Even though some got to be sent to Germany for, uh, for uh, occupation, you might say, for after-war occupation. But I, okay, now you go, I was sent to go to the Philippines, to Japan. So, okay, then I had to report to Camp de Oregon by the 15th of August. And of course, after my furlough at home and I catching the bus at Linton, going to Bismarck, and to Bismarck to Minot. And there I visited the convent, the convent of nuns there. I had some first cousins there that were nuns there. And I uh, had a good visit with them. And they said they would, they would pray for me. And, uh, and then I went on from there, went to, to, to the train, to the, yeah, to the train, Norton, whatever they call it, came through there. And I had to catch the train and to, to down to camp there, Oregon. I had to be there by the 15th of August. But I was there a few days earlier. And then we was getting ready to get shipped out. And sure as heck, that's, then we heard something about there, some, this atomic bomb was dropped into Japan. That's ending the war. Well, gee, or that's the best, best news that I could hear. And then, and then from there, we were shipped to, uh, to the state of Washington, uh, right offhand, I can't think of the camp. And then on the 20, or no, on the 1st of September, that was in 44. Five went on the ship. Okay, now we're sailing out to the far or yonder, 
far, 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 far away. And, uh, and then right away, the first few days, some guys got so sick. Oh, did they get sick. I, I, I. And then uh, you know, from the ship, you know, going from the ship, waving back and forth. And I thought, boy, I'm, I don't want to get that sick. I'm not going to eat. Then I got nothing to throw up. So I didn't eat for about two days, but pretty soon I got so darn hungry that I, I ate orange. Whew, that did it. From there I started heaving and heaving and heaving, and there was nothing to throw up. Oh, what, oh, was I sick? And one of my buddies got so sick, and uh, he was heaving over the side, and uh, he always tells me that I saved his life. He would have fell overboard by, uh, you know, when you heave so hard and hanging on the. The, the railing, the side is only was only about four feet high, four, maybe five feet, maybe four or five. Then you could hang over, you could look down the water. So anyway, then I got over that, so I wasn't sick no more. So so okay, then we went to the Hawaiian Islands, and there we stopped a little bit, about two miles north of the Hawaiian Islands, and then we refueled. And one of my good friends, they took off. He was, he got all the sick, and then uh, he, they took him off. And then, then we went on to the Philippines. And then we went through the Philippine Islands, and they, then we came in on the Indian Ocean on the west side there. And then we landed, and we landed on the by Batangas. Batangas. That's about oh, 50, 60 miles south of Manila. Manila is the capital of. Uh, of the Philippines, of the Luzon Island. That's a big island, Luzon. That's where the capital is, Manila. There's other islands there, too. But did I say it while the war was over by that time, see? So which was my, which was just a blessing for me that, that the war was over, but we were being, supposed to be prepare, preparing to invade Japan, and that would have cost thousands of lives rather than, uh, than the people that died uh, in the, to the tummy bomb there when Nagasaki Hiroshima was bombed there. Anyway, well then my occupation was quite leisurely there in the Philippines. What could I do? Well then I, I liked to work in the kitchen. I volunteered for the kitchen and guarding. We had to guard war materials and this and that and and uh, uh, work in the kitchen. Yeah. And then we had to guard the just a big Japanese camp there. We guard the camp so the, the Japs they would break out or something like that. And then everyone's then during the daytime a, a few of the Jap, Japanese were taken out to different groups and they had to do work for us. And then I had a few Japanese on the on the me they give them detail now to do this, do that, or working in the kitchen or cleaning up some cleaning up some lawn or something like that. And uh they weren't pretty nice people. And chaps, they were they would behave pretty good. They uh, they would I think for them the war was over too. They were I got some good uh good um, memories because some of them, they gave me some uh, some old money, a few things, and for and I still have that old Japanese money from them, the Japanese there. And uh, then I had to, to then you had to 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 uh, to guard the kitchen facilities there, on the outside, so nobody would come in the night and break in. But we were also told to watch the the garbage cans. Because the Americans had a lot of food, and then a lot of it was thrown into the garbage. And there, there was always, we was also warned that Japanese still hiding out. It, sure, the war is over, but you were not completely safe. You be careful. And uh, they could come down in the night or whatever, and uh, attack you or whatever. And, uh, or they could, they could come down and steal the, steal the garbage. But then, I remember walking guard, then I heard something rattle in the short sure like I seen somebody come to the garbage can stealing food. What what I got, what was I gonna do? I know how it is when you're poor. 
So I just walked the other way. I didn't see it. Stealing when the when they come, I assume it looked like it was Filipinos st stealing garbage out of the uh, out of the um, uh, cans that the Americans had thrown away. They scoop up some of that food that they get home. It's supposed to eat because they were very very poor. The, the Filipinos there. So uh, that kind of sums up my uh, was mostly guard duty there and, and cleaning up and cleaning up some old machines and paintings and whatnot. And they, I suppose there wasn't many soldiers there yet. They didn't know just what to do with them. And then finally came the time where we was where we was sending. Oh, by the way, in in uh, February, some of us. I recalled that we could could get shipped to the Hawaiian Islands, and I was one of them. So I was shipped to the Hawaiian Islands, and then I was uh, my job was working in the building area, giving beddings, beddings, and uh, assigning a, a room for those that came in by plane, most mostly officers, uh, to assign them to our rooms. And to, uh, when the planes left, you had to. Uh, by telephone, call them up, or go down, run down to the to their barracks, and call them that your plane is leaving. So I was I was working in the building building area all the while while I was the Hawaiian Islands, and that was then the last part of September, and we were asked that we said, well, the time is up, you can you can go home. So so we came by ship, come through the. Golden Gate Bridge, then I got to see the Golden Gate Bridge from underneath. And then we passed Alcatraz, that's the big, uh, that was that, that big prison at that time yet. Alcatraz, that's in the ocean there from from uh, San Francisco Bay in their ways. And then we were on the train, and then we were shipped again to the state of Washington. Maybe it was Fort Lewis. And there, there we were mustered out. They called it mustered out. Now you can go home. So I got the train and uh, come to Dawson. I was alone then by that time. So what the heck, there's nobody here because there was no telephones. My folks didn't have no telephones. Okay, now what? I looked around, there's nobody there. So I put my bag on my back and started walking. And she was like, here comes the car. I was a little bit out of town and picks me up. Well, where are you going? Well, I told him, it's about 18 miles southwest of Napoleon. That's where my home is. So I, they took me home then. Maybe at that time I knew who it was, but today I don't know who anymore who took me home. So I came home. Oh, boy. It was nice coming home, shaking hands with my brothers, young brothers. I could see your hands got big already, and uh, they were just trashing. And they were glad to get get another man for the trashing crew. And the next morning, I was out out pitching pitching bundles. You know, that was that was the end of the of my uh, of my of my tour. Perhaps I left out some stuff, but you can't, you can't think of everything just now and then, you know. Uh, I have a habit when I talk, and I do that when I sing, closing my eyes. <laughs> is it because I can concentrate better? Maybe or what it is. I don't mean to do that, because it's, I feel it's an honor to be, uh, to be interviewed. <laughs>